during the interview process, there are a lot of people who say they want more community-oriented policing. And I always sort of shook my head at it because where I come from, um, you know, Charlotte PD, Dayton PD, my township PD, the sheriff's office would kill to have these guys out here too. Um, we had, during one of the last big snows, there was the plows come through, Jason and his crew goes through, they plow the snow. I know at least on a couple occasions, the patrol officers got the shovels and helped people dig their cars out. Um, and there was a person in town who inadvertently locked herself out of the house. One of my patrol officers, one of my larger patrol officers, um, was able to get down, get his head and the shoulder through the cat door and a stick. <laughs> and was actually able to unlock her door. And, and trust me, those things don't happen in other places. Um, we respond, if you call us, we're gonna send a car, we're gonna come out, or we'll meet you at the PD, whatever your preference is. That is who we wanna be. Um, the officers that I have, everyone I'm just committed to. So, so that's what I see, I think there's improvements to be made within the police department. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very good place to work, but it's not a great place to get a ton of real hard work from the experience. So I sort of like it that what people want is for us to be Andy Griffin, and at times we've got to turn it on and be Hawaii Pilot. Um, and these officers, it's going to take them a while. I've got five new officers. They're all doing very well. I have no people that I would consider problem children. They come to work, there's no abuse of sick time, there's no disrespect issues. We have one officer, I'm sure everybody's aware of, made a bad judgment back in November. Um, it was a decision made pretty much like this. It was a poor decision. That officer admitted to it from point A. The story has not changed will not change through the criminal proceeding or whatever that shakes out. There was never any real dispute as to what happened. Um, so I commend the officers in the department. They had that work ethic and that morale ethic before they ever came in. My job now is to make them the best officers and the best department they can be. And to uh, give them the leadership role, but they'll follow by example. I will give them parameters. I will pat them on the back when they do well, and I'll spank them when they do bad. And that's sort of how I see my role. Um, one of the first things that they asked me to talk about here are the policy plans with the, the PD. Um, now I apologize because I've got lots and lots of flyers here and stuff. I did not make copies because I didn't know how many to make. Anything that anybody wants, if they want to email me, chief at yso.com, or chief at bio.yellowsprings.oh.us or you can call the PD, I'll be happy to get it for you. I can print it, email it to you, anything I reference, you can have. But I uh, didn't want to make a ton of copies and the stuff away. Chief, we're going to turn the lights on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when it comes to policy, Yellow Springs has a very good training program. They cover a lot of policies and things in policy that needs to be done. But a lot of this is not very formalized. And where I came from, there was 30, 40, 50 some policies. Um, and when I got here, I found about six or eight. I have policies that refer to other policies that no longer exist. And, and I think what happened in all the mix of the chiefs in between when Grody had the leader's policies, I can find some of those, and Arthur Scott had some, and Bedford had some, but things got lost, things got missing. And uh, you know, my job is to do predominantly three things here, is to ensure the safety and well-being of the people of Yellow Springs and the visitors that come in, to maintain the safety and well-being of my officers, and to protect the village of Yellow Springs as an entity from liability. And to do that in policy, it needs to be written down. We need to get out of the age of just inferring that, well, this is what we've always done. That doesn't stand up in court. It does not protect you. Um, 
So we're in the process of pushing out a lot of policies. I've got a couple officers in here who can verify there's three or four a week just depending on their length coming out. Um, what I have done is uh, we've pushed out uh, the general orders format saying how it will be done, the written directives, law enforcement's role, consular notification, which is federal law that says if you detain certain people from certain countries that are foreign nationals, you have to do things or you're in violation of foreign law or um, federal law. Uh, the organizational structure, conditions of work, professional conduct rules, these rules are above and beyond what are in the village code. There's certain databases, things that we do that doesn't always fit with the road department and the electric department. Um, how those investigations would then be handled, professional conduct investigations, uniform requirements, what we're going to wear, how we're going to look, patrol operations, domestic violence policy, which is mandated by the state, bank and financial response, or uh, bank financial institution response, and uh, a seized asset internal control policy, which is again mandated by state. I got about twice that number that need to be generated out, the ones I've named and the ones we've done. Uh, pursuit policy needs to be put out with patrol equipment, how many missing persons, uh, the countywide active shooter response, rendering emergency care, use of force, mission statement, mutual aid agreements, uh, other patrol uh, procedures, and people with mental illnesses. Um, in car recording devices, we have mobile visions inside the cars. There's got to be a policy that mandates when they're allowed. Uh, use of those terminals, dealing with juveniles, unusual occurrences, a whole section on traffic practices, techniques, uniform procedures, enforcement, enforcement techniques, traffic crashes, control of directions. We we're going to put on those pretty yellow vests that we have to get out in the middle of the street because OSHA mandates that. Um, prisoner transportation, a whole section for dispatch, uh, leads, which is our how we run once, uh, once and warrants and all those fun things. Emergency dispatch operations, evidence, since we have an evidence room, and an internal control policy for our records. That's why I have down listed. We may add more as we go on. Um, there's where I want to go with policy and procedure. Domestic violence policy, they want me to address that. The law requires certain things. Again, the has always been in, in, in within the, the law. We've been operating within the law. But if somebody doesn't do it, I'm sort of like, well, what do I discipline them for? Because it needs to be written down somewhere. Um, what the law pretty much says in Ohio is if an officer goes out, and has reason to believe that physical harm has occurred, then there is a preferred arrest policy. In other words, they're going to have to justify to me why we did not arrest someone. So you go out with a couple, and you can tell it got physical, and I'm not talking about you push me and I push you, because harm isn't just pushing, okay? But if I'm 6'3", and you're 5'2", and you push me, and I knock you down the steps, it's a different story. So, predominantly the policy will say, in those situations, you pretty much got to make an arrest unless you can justify why not. you got, you got a 19-year-old son, his son suffers uh, from uh, mental illness, suffers from something else, he acts out. It's a different story, and there are exceptions in the law for that. The other thing the law says we've got to do is report domestic disputes. We do this by a form, it's a checkbox form, it has to be submitted, because that is what the state mandates. Uh, again, we've always done it, we'll continue to do it, but now it's a little more codified. Um, as far as police citizens interactions, day-to-day -day traffic stops, one of the things that I find is people do not understand things coming from a cop's perspective. And we as officers, especially when we've done it for 30 years, forget what it's like to handle it from a citizen's perspective. You know, I said I'm talking to my wife, and my wife works in a dispatch center. So I forget what it's like to not be a cop. Um, and I will apologize, because at times I tend to explain things like a cop, 
and it doesn't always resonate from your end and you don't understand it. Um, we had uh, an individual last week who was a little upset. One of my officers sees him, she speeds up, runs his plate, backs back off, gets the information, decides to make a traffic stop on this individual. Uh, she does a textbook the way the academy does it. You call it in, you put the, you know, the overheads on, they pull over, you try to pick an area where you're safe, you don't want to be on the other side of the hill. I'm 68 because a semi comes over and oops, then we have a hurt office. So there's a tactical way to do this. You then take that bright spotlight that we have, you put it in the side rear view mirror so that it is now shining back in an individual's eyes. And he's upset, he's a little upset. And I apologize for it, but that is an accepted best practice in the state of Ohio. <laughs> and you do that because you don't know who you're encountering. I know it's Yellow Springs, and I know most people sort of know most people. But I've got five new officers who don't know most people yet. And if an officer told me, well, you know what, I knew that was Kent, and so I didn't put this light on, I'm going to go, why don't you do this? Why don't you light them up, get up to the car, you know it's Ken, you come back to the car, then you can turn them off. Because I want to protect them. I will take, if it's, um, I'll get into Friday night stop. Friday night, one of the officers goes to make a stop. Uh, the individual then takes off, he lights them up. They drive around for about 20 seconds at about 40 miles an hour in a 25 zone. This guy hits the straight zone, goes up to 80. Uh, the officer does not go up to Katie with him, which I think is a great idea, because it's a traffic stop, it's not worth it. At some point, you have to wait risk and harm. So the officer sort of let him go. He crashes out uh, on the Antioch, hits the picnic tables and things like this. Flees on foot, the officer gets there, there's two females in the car. He gets them secure. Uh, backpack in the car, there's some weed in the car, there's also a gun. They locate the individual in town. Um, he is on parole, aggravated robbery, felonious assault, uh, ends up, the other two people in the car said, yep, the dope, the gun is his. We never know. Just because that car is Ken's, that us Ken drive the car. How do you know at two in the morning, number one, I don't think Ken would be up. Maybe he is, maybe he's a little wilder than I think. But you never know until you get up there. So my answer to this guy was, look, I have absolutely no problem once they recognize you, realize who you were, you get back in the car, and you want to kill some of the lights, not blame this individual, because you know they're from Yellow Springs and they're not a threat. I'm fine with that. But there are accepted best practices, and that's what I want my officers to do. Um, and then they can moderate that. I told them tonight, it, it, it's much easier for you to go out thinking the worst and moderating down than thinking this is absolutely no problem and having to ratchet up because that's when things go bad for police officers. Um, the other policy they sort of wanted me to talk about was this patrols, priority beats. Um, the way we've got things scheduled, I normally have mobile cars on at a time. Uh, we've really not got to a beat situation because Crime rates is no one all that hot. I would much rather produce intelligent officers who think well on their feet and can assess that, hey, we're having problems here. Or we just, somebody just moved in and they've got uh, four kids and the kids like to sneak out in the middle of the night. So we're having problems on West South College or somewhere and give them the ability to address those problems as, as they proceed. Um, we do get complaints that come through, come through council, come through the village manager. You can call me, I mean, I'll direct and say we want extra checks, we want this. But we're not really going to get into a specific beat situation short of snows and emergency shutdown. The roads are so bad that we're not going to be able to respond to non-emergency situations. And then policy addresses that, that's one of the policies. So I have somebody sort of on the north end somebody at the PD, so that if you're on President Street somewhere and something happens, we don't go all the way across town to get to. I want an officer stationary in one spot on the north and one on the north and south. So, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but if you want to start into questions? Or? I'm actually the 
There are a lot of questions I have, but I, I want to start with one. Um, it, there's a, I feel there's a community advantage to having a police officer to live in town. Uh, not too many years ago, I think it was required, it was just a law that they had to live in town. All of our officers live in town. Chief McKee, Lynch, Banner, Nipper, Pierce, Brody, uh, the children of uh, Banner, officers of Banner, Pierce, and Nipper were in uh, um, school classes with my kids. Uh, Winks, White, Todd, and Mills Lawn. Uh, this Yellow Streets was their home. Uh, everyone knew them. They knew everyone else. Uh, and they were respected. There was not really fear of officers. My, my son, uh, uh, you know, he knew uh, all of them personally. Uh, I'm really concerned that I think, I don't know about these new officers, but only, I think only one officer lives in town now. I think it's a real loss to the community. I'd like to hear your perspective of that. And I'm also wondering if it wouldn't be to our community's advantage to give a bonus pay to any officer who would choose to live in town because it is more expensive living in town, and I, but I think the community would benefit from that. Um, I believe for, for, for any quality, there, there's a good and a bad to it. Now, I believe you're, you're absolutely right. There's certain qualities that would clearly be there. I mean, to me, the difference between being stubborn and stick to it this depends a lot on what coin you're looking at. Um, the, actually, the city of Dayton, their ROP sued the Dayton Police Department on a federal lawsuit, uh, I want to guess, eight, ten years ago. And they predominantly said residency is, is inappropriate, so they can no longer do that. Um, as to the bonus, that would be something that council would have to offer. It's not something that I really, in my budget, have. Um, I, I think there is some good and some bad to that. Um, and you've got a very, very dedicated council. You've got a very dedicated village manager here. But they're 24-7 council and village managers. And when you take on that role, you, you, you realize that when you go to Tom's to get groceries, there's a likelihood that someone's going to grab your ear. So there's also there's, there's a flip side of that. Um, and I think just as the nation has changed, um, I've got a, a clip in from the newspaper. We think it's maybe 1940, 41. Uh, the PD was actually in what used to be a shoe shine place downtown. It was five foot wide, 20 foot long. Um, they predominantly walked the beat, um, but that's how things used to be. But society has changed. We're far more mobile. Uh, the advent of cell phones completely changed things. When I was on the street back in the 90s, and you had a homicide, you know, Sardis did this, they did that, and handled certain things. You call out the detective, and the detective would come out. Now with cell phones, everybody's getting phone calls. I've been woke up about how many times at three or four in the morning. I responded out to most things because we've become more mobile, and that's what society sort of expects. Um, so I think it's easier to live, not live in that area. Um, I worked, I live in Washington Township. I worked there a year. It was probably the least favorite place that I worked. I wanted to, I worked North Dixie Strip for a long time. I like about seven and a half, eight years on the midnight. I loved it. At one point I told my wife I want to actually spread up and down there. Um, I think dedicated people are dedicated. I think people with work ethic have work ethic. I think people who don't, don't. And I don't think you have to live in the town to necessarily have that dedication. Um, and, and again, I think when you see what some of the officers have done, and I can pull up reports and show you whether that officer lives in town and that officer doesn't live in town, I don't know if it has that kind of bearing. Um, but clearly, if they wish to live here, that, that is fine. But I think you also have to look at your applicant pool because we have people come up quite a bit and ask for applications. Very few are your residents. And you would very, very much limit your, your applicant pool. Uh, and I very much would like to have the best officer I can possibly get each and every time, as opposed to going, I have to take this, this C student over here because they live in town instead of this A student over here. So I think there's good and bad. I think you have a point. Um, 
you know, it's not something I can put in effect, but I also think there's some negative consequences to that from us. Are there people with questions about the things you've been talking about with policies and uh, things? My name is Isaac Gellner. Uh, your report in the news is stating that uh, minor traffic stops with the hopes of discovering crime unfairly target low-income peoples and young peoples. Knowing this, why would you keep pursuing this tactic? You're, you're asking me why would we make traffic stops? Knowing that minor traffic stops unfairly target low-income people and young people, why would you keep pursuing this tactic? I, okay, I, I think maybe you're taking it somewhat out of context. The officers are going to get out there and make traffic stops. It's what we do. And it does, it is the belief of me, I believe every police officer in the state of Ohio, and my guess is across the nation, that that visibility is a deterrent. Now what happens is at 50 something, I've retired once, I've got an income here, I'm now getting a second income from Yellow Springs, guess what? I take my car and get the oil changed now. I don't do that anymore. And they come in and they tell me, hey look, you got this license plate out, great bucks will replace it. Well, tell you all, I was 23 starting out, oh no, I could buy the dollar 50 and get the light bulb, I could replace it myself. You know, my windshield gets cracked, I'll get it fixed. I've got that money. I, my point was that when the officers get out and make stops, especially when you start looking at vehicle defects, people who are poor and younger and have less finances tend to have more vehicle defects. You know, what I don't want is my officers then citing everybody indiscriminately. Because again, that's not what it's necessarily about. It is a visibility thing. It is what we do. The officer that stopped the car Friday night did it for a license plate. That's why we do it. Because you got a guy running around with guns and drugs, he's coming to this town, and it, it deterred him. I mean, I, I can prove it to you, that's what we do. And again, it is considered best practice across the state of Ohio. So I want my office to be sympathetic to young people, and people who don't have means don't need a ticket. I get, the only time I've seen a, a ticket for a license plate like, is when that then leads into something else. It's not something we do. People drive around all the time without a headlight out and don't realize. The traffic stop is half as much as say, hey brother, just to let you know, you got a headlight out, okay? Let me check a couple things, we'll get you on your way. We don't write a lot of headlight tickets. It's not what we do. So, but they will continue to do it because it is effective and I believe it does deter, deter crime. I also missed something, but I thought on your policies uh, you would be mentioning use of excessive force. Where is that? There is a use of force policy. I didn't name it. Uh, it is not published out yet. I have let the guys look at it, um, so they sort of know where I stand. But it spells out um, force as and, and the procedure as to when it happens. They are trained through the academy. It was known as a use force continuum. Um, that is standard police training as you go through. It's required in the state of Ohio. I think one thing the public has to realize is a police officer acting in the line of duty gets to use more force against a suspect than that suspect is using against them. That law gives us that ability. It's not an even Stephen thing. If you want to kick me, I don't kick back. I pick up a club and I strike back because the law gives us that ability. Um, there is, on that use force continuum, you, you, you use that then as a judge, as a basis. Again, you get in the situation, I got a 6'3 officer and a 5'2", 90 pound woman who doesn't, uh, is, is illegally protest something and she wants to sit down and listen. Okay? Use of force is I can use certain pain compliance techniques and joint manipulation to move this woman 
That's not what we do for 92 year old one. But I also have a 100 pound office. So if that officer goes out with a six foot, 250 pound guy at Speedway at six in the morning, who's stolen the phone from the clerk and is uh, being very, very disruptive, that officer is a little more apt and is gonna give a little more leeway in the amount of force she needs or could use in that situation. That actually happened. Uh, it's been about six, eight weeks ago. The officer used zero force. She was able to talk the guy down, get him to comply, get him in the cruiser, and we took him off to the hospital for help. Or, no, I think that he did it up. I got it correct. He did it to the hospital for help. They released him. We had to take him to jail at the time. Um, but there's, so it's sort of a, um, there's not this hard line to say if you do this, you, you, you get this. But there is a continuum, there are guidelines, um, and one of the things I truly believe and where police departments get into trouble is when that use of force is a rubber stamp. It cannot be. Uh, leadership starts at the top. The attitude of this police department starts at the top. Um, I cannot control everything. It's like having 10 kids. I love them to death. I will try to teach them the right thing to do. I will try to set the right example. Most of them will follow, and every now and then they'll screw up. Um, and so I will attempt to address the screw ups when they happen, depending on how severe they are. But that's how you sort of lead things. You've got to look at it, and when the use of force happens, there's got to be a true critique. They've got to know whether this was right, whether it was wrong. There's got to be discipline if it's wrong. That discipline if it's minor, maybe nothing more than you know, this was a little much, maybe you got a little too loud, you didn't have to do this, you didn't have to use profane language, or maybe, look, you violated it so bad, we're going to see the charges on um, That is, Those are all within my discretion, and my officers have to believe, as much as I like them, as, and I can be friendly with them, my job in the world, first of all, is a boss, and as a boss, I have to have that critique. I, they have to believe that when they do something, it will be looked at fairly and impartial across the board. No officer gets preferential treatment because I go fishing with that individual or I like that that person better than this person. That, that can't exist. That's bad for a police department. And I will try very, very hard to not follow that track. Does that answer most of it? Yeah. Yeah, go, go ahead, Jen. No, uh, uh, I'll review the policy I'd like to look at it. Okay, I definitely can do that. You can also Google use of force continuum. Uh, there's all sorts of, of, which is the term we use. It'll, it'll come up with tons of little pictures and stuff, which I think would be very helpful. My name is Catherine Hitchcocks. Um, I believe that you have talked about um, uh, making sure that three to four officers perhaps are trained in the next year in CIT, which is crisis intervention training, which will help people who have a mental illness um, or are, have an alcohol or drug problem in crisis. Um, is that correct? Well, I did make that statement and I checked. Uh, the only person in the police officer role at the Yellow Springs that has not had some form of CIT training is the chief right now. Um, all of them have had various degrees of training, some of them for a four-hour week. Um, when I went up in the management at the sheriff's office, we got very little patrol-type training for my last eight or so years. And in my time in the drug unit and the, and the homicide unit, the five crimes unit, they didn't send me to this one. Um, so if there's anybody who is lacking training right now, it is me. Uh, Chief Pettifer, after the, the prior incident, the Bali Shank incident, made sure everybody got the training. I believe everyone has it. I've been told everybody has it. I've not physically looked at it, but I did an informal, informal survey, and everyone is trained. And I will be trained. Uh, this is more an observation. Uh, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal about seven years ago why are so many serious criminals tripped up by routine traffic stops? And the answer is because they are sociopaths and they don't just believe that if they can rob banks and get away with it, they also believe the traffic laws don't apply to them. And from reading the Yellow Springs News and the police reports, my observation is a very high percentage of your traffic stops result in finding people who are intoxicated, have suspended licenses, have an open container, have a drugs, uh, and other serious problems. And so I would say here, I certainly don't think your target
I can tell you they get out, they walk, they do business checks downtown. Uh, again, these two guys that are in here are very, very good about being out, being mobile, being seen, being on foot. Um, you know, to me, it's more than just being downtown and shaking doors, though. I and mean, that's one of the things. You know, like it's, it's stopping and talking to people. And um, some of the community policing things, it's two-way street. The officers can make a lot of effort. But one of the first things that struck me here, I stopped at someone's house, met that individual, one of the meetings, and I stopped, and she was out talking to her neighbor, so I stopped and talked to her, this kind of stuff. And she called me later and said the neighbor wasn't real comfortable with me being here. The, the, the neighbor wasn't real comfortable with me being here because I stopped in front of her house. And there is that perception that some people don't want the police officers there, don't want the neighbors going, what was he doing? You know, don't want anyone thinking, oh my, something must have went wrong. It's a small community, and everybody sort of knows everybody. So there is that every now and then of, you know, I don't want the officers to stop. And I got to respect that too. But we will be out, we'll be mobile. I think as my five newer officers, get more time out and get seen a little more. I, I, again, you know, we're out sh shuffling walks up right now and then and going through cat doors and, uh, you know, we do lockouts. We do all these things that the bigger police departments do not do. Uh, I'm having lunch at the school tomorrow. I'm speaking Saturday midday. Um, you know, we're out there doing what we can do, doing what anyone's asking of us. And again, these officers are as friendly as they will be with anyone who will be friendly with them. But they don't go through town shaking everybody's hand because not everybody wants their hand shook. So. so I know there may be more comments and questions. Is there someone who's, I, I want to make sure we don't run out of time for the other topics. So at this point, I think, I, I think the idea is that if there's things that you, got, that you didn't get to ask, that you can uh, write them on the paper or make suggestions that way or um, make time to, to ask that question. I hate to cut anybody off, but I also want to make sure we don't cut short the other topics. So do you want to talk a little bit about conversation number two? Would that sound like you? Uh, yeah, the budget, the budget's going to be boring. They have to talk about the budget. Do not blame me. Um, my budget is set by council to some degree. I'm spending so much money. It's pretty much an open book. It is a public document if you want it. The majority of stuff goes for personnel costs, benefits, wages, insurance. That's where the bulk of it goes. Uh, there is some, you know, money set aside for schools, etc. Uh, but there's not a whole lot of discretionary spending. Uh, one of the things, as Yellow Springs, we did tighten this belt this year, and I was here in October. I'm not sure if I'd be a full-time chief or not, but they needed to tighten, and I said, "Look, well, we'll get by here." And you know, all honesty, we can probably get by two more years without a cruiser. But if we go next year without a cruiser, then we're going to have a cruiser every year in a row for four years. So it's one of those things where, you know, equipment has to be replaced. Uh, the guys have to have training, all that kind of stuff. And you take those things out of there, it does not leave me much. Um, the, one of the things I think what the question I was trying to get to was like the seized asset money that we get from the state of Ohio, uh, predominantly from the Drug Task Force, and uh, other seizures. There was a thousand dollars that car Friday night that will eventually, because of the drugs and the charges, more than likely get seized. Uh, that money then will go uh, into Yellow Springs and go to the sea gas. Pretty much the law mandates certain things we can do. The, the funds come in one of two ways, either a federal seizure or a state seizure. Um, there is a hearing. I know TBE sometimes makes cop work look like we do things and then suddenly uh, it's just what happens. It's boring, boring typing and police work. The case packet we have in the, uh, the, the stop Friday night is probably 85 pages long already, okay? Um, there is, for us to, we have seized that money. That means there's probable cause there to put that money in the limbo. Uh, that bag 
that guy is not going to get it right or what. But there is a forfeiture that has to happen. That is a civil thing that will happen through courts. That individual has a right to an attorney. You have an attorney, a public defender will present it for that also. We just don't take money from people. Um, cops are not given that kind of power. I know sometimes it sort of looks that way, but it's not how things in fact happen. Uh, there'll be a hearing on that money. That individual can waive the hearing, in which case then the money will come to us minus the cost of the proceeding, which is 20%. So that thousand so dollars we're looking at getting any money. Um, law mandates how that money can be spent. And it boils down to, uh, there's different rules both federally and state, but pretty much any legitimate law enforcement function. A law enforcement function is training, vehicles, uh, new guns, new equipment, uniforms, um, uh, computer equipment, anything that we need to function the way we do. Um, it does not include donating money to 5Ks. It does not include money to buy pizzas uh, for the kids. You cannot do that. It's a violation of the law. The sheriff in Athens County just got jammed up and indicted. If anybody's following that, he's claiming he spent money out of the wrong funds and all this kind of stuff. But there's very, very hard sort of guidelines that this money has to be spent. Um, one of the things we did was there was a black one prior to me, they bought um, the next edition, which is our old car. They had two white chargers, and they bought a black charger, and so did the car. Um, I don't get out that much. I don't really need a car. I'll take one of the cruisers. I'll take the old white crown bit. So we have now painted that black charger um, white. We're getting it fully equipped as a patrol car. The computer and stuff inside, I think I've spent $4,000 there, close to $2,000 getting it repainted. Uh, another 18 or so hundred getting it stickered. Uh, we went back to the old school stickers. I, I like them better, uh, the way it is on the blazer. Uh, and I've used federal seized assets for that because there really wasn't money in my, or state seized assets for that, because there really wasn't money in my budget to do that. So that's what I sort of do with the money. If we see their training budget, that's what I'd love to see the assets for. Um, the, the PD has always had issued block 40s. And I don't know if too many people here are gun people, but it's, they issue a really, really fairly big handgun. And again, I have an officer who is 100, 510 pounds. And it seems to me um, that a really, really big handgun shooting 40 caliber doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So one of the things I plan to do is to buy some 9 millimeter, millimeter smaller frame handguns for people's smaller hands with less kickback because if we ever get in a situation and they have to use that weapon and they have to put a second bullet out of it, I'd like for it to go where the first bullet went and not stray off, which is the problem. If you're shooting, you understand this. The first one goes where you point, then there's a kickback, and you don't get back on sight. And, and what happens is you shoot two or three rounds and they start drifting up and so uh, nine don't have the kick. I'm planning on, on opening up the policy, the use force policy, which will specify what guns we can carry, what ammo we can carry, what tools we can carry, all that stuff tied in it, sort of somewhat depending on some of those issues. Um, and that's one of the things I'd like to do. Um, the also says to ask for different shoulder bikes. That'll probably be purchased out of that money. Um, you know, you don't, you don't want to spend it broke, but it's not there to sit, to accumulate either. Um, you know, so it could be used for anything that is a criminal justice purpose. All right, anyone have questions about the budget? Hi, my name is Patrick. I have a question uh, with respect to how the budget gets decided for your department. I know in a lot of other communities in Ohio, uh, you know, it happens. It will happen in an election. Like for example, for fire, you get to vote on uh, that department's budget. For streets, 
sometimes the EMS and open the line to redo it here in those strings. What has been your experience, or could you talk to us about uh, the possibility of deciding your budget by voting here? I know now, especially if we have uh, a little bit of a budget crunch. And what has your experience been with that, uh, with Green County or any department you were at before, uh, pros and cons and so forth? Uh, if you could just speak to that for a few minutes, that would be great. No, no, I really can't. Um, and mainly because I've never really been part of it. Um, actually, the village manager would probably be better to speak to that. As I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, the village does not have specific levies for specific items. It comes in as a pool of money, and then that budget is just broken up by the village manager, by, by council. See, I told you I can't speak on it. Um, and again, then my budget was what it was last year, 2% more, or I really don't have a reference. Actually, we have Okay, the budget was cut from the 2014 budget. Um, the, where I came from, Delaware County, um, yes, the, there was, Sheriff's Office can contract places. Now, Washington Township, which is um, 725 right between Centerville and the Mall, um, outside of Centerville's Washington Township, Harrison Township, North Dixie Drive, North Main Street, and then Jefferson Township, which is West Dayton, once you get outside the city limits, and South Third Street, all contracted to the Sheriff's Office, and they all put on police levies. Um, and then that levy, that money that comes in can only be used for that. Um, if there's an overage, it has to sit. If there's an underage, then they have to wait for the levy and have to be re-voted on you know, every two or three years, depending on how long it was the levy run, which is why we get a renewal levy as opposed to a adding millage. But after that, my knowledge of all that is, is pretty pretty elementary. Um, yeah, I think it would be something for the council chose to do that. That would be their call and their decision, not mine. The village manager, so she could address that. Um, essentially, we have one levy in the village. It's a general services levy. Uh, that levy is passed and money goes into the general fund and it's divvied up into departments <coughs> based on that. Um, other than the general fund, um, we have enterprise funds, which are the water, the sewer, specifically run by the rates and collections for those services. But as far as the general fund, it is one levy um, that funds the general fund, which is a variety of services, and does include the police department, among other things. So. Hi. Um, one of the things uh, I think would be good to have part of the conversation is what goes into sizing the police force? Um, we have a budget crunch. The police part of the budget is really significant. Um, and obviously, personnel is the biggest part of the, uh, of the police force budget. Um, in 19, I don't know what, you know, I don't know the court, but Yellow Springs, what would be an optimum size police force? What would be an okay size police force. I do know that in 1960, the police force at Holster was four full-time officers and three part-time officers. I don't know what we have now, but I'm going to inspect it with the one down in East Lansing, but uh, what goes into size? How, how is that kind of judgment? Okay. Well, I think that that's a great question. Um, again, I think some of that I have to defer to council and the village manager. Um, I know in the paper I found a very good sort of analysis of some of these things. Um, I think the one variable in there that we've got to sort of look at the commercial prospects of Yellow Springs. Uh, New Leaven, I believe, is 35, 3,600 people. And so you can sort of look at us in New Leaven, us in Eden. But I have any of those towns. And, and uh, New Lebanon, outside west of, west of Dayton, even just north of here, um, you do not get the influx of people. You do not get the influx of shopping. 
You do not get the weekend's crowds that, that I, and I've been there since October. I'm going to have an eye-opening experience on the first really nice day, weekend day of May, I'm sure. Um, so I think you sort of got to balance instead of just looking at, you know, these people have 3,500, we have 3,700, they have 3,600, and comparing them, I think you've got to look at what retail brings in and how important it is to the village and the village economy. Um, this, our staff that we set prior to me, um, we handle most calls, and I've not been here to a summit. So I, I hate to, I can tell you the last six months, our staff has been at least adequate, if not over adequate. But what happens when, you know, the, the number of people in this village goes from 3,700 to 6,500 or 7,000 or uh, 7,500? You know, we have some bars that bring in pretty good crowds, and we want to continue that because that in itself is a source of revenue. And, you know, if you don't have a police department that can respond to that kind of a crowd, where does it really put you? Um, so I do not believe with the number of people that I believe will be here come summer and some of these warmer weekends that we're overly staffed. Um, you know, and a lot of it's going to depend on the type of calls. But um, you know, you're talking sometimes having those crowds out there and one officer, two officers, I mean, think about it, if something goes downhill because the whole idea is having contingencies, do you want to be that one office? Um, you know, and, and so a lot of those questions, I think, again, need to be if answered, answered more eloquently and adequately by council of those managers.
cops are no different. We record things for a living, but it doesn't mean we're infallible. Um, and trust me, I'd much rather have a videotape and go back and go, ooh, that's what I did, and write it down than something happening, a very intense, dramatic thing that unfolds in a matter of four seconds, and I have to write about it for the next 45 minutes. Boy, that video, you know, if the picture's worth a thousand word, the video's worth a million. I love the idea of it, but um, I am probably not the grandiose idea guy. I'm the wait to see, let somebody else pay for getting all this stuff squared up, and then I'll adopt it when it becomes practical. And I think it will become practical in the next couple of years, and again, that's a good use of the seized asset money. <laughs> Other questions about the budget? Well then, we're just going once or one twice, something like that. We might give people a chance to think. So then maybe why don't we move on to the uh, topic of the police, the ACE task force. Um, tell you what, we, if you don't mind, no, let's do no. SWAT first. Sure. Um, and then, be, because I, I Sometimes the acronyms can get confusing. So we'll start with SWAT, which is the uh, Sheriff and Xenia combined special weapons and tactics. Um, we do not, Yellow Springs does not have a body on the SWAT team at this point. We did, uh, prior to um, the Polish Shank incident, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, um, that officer is left, we've not put anyone on. Whether or not we have an officer on that task force, to me, is almost sort of a battle of semantics. Because from a police chief stand, this is, and, and trust me, I believe there were mistakes made that night. I, there's several hundred page report in my office. I have not read all a couple hundred pages. Uh, there were mistakes made. There were some things that did not go well or right. There were missteps and miscalculations. I will not debate that at all. But for me, it is no different than if you had a tractor crash and you're seriously injured. You call in the best equipment you have for what's ailing you at that time. And if that's care flight, the fire department and the police department is going to call in care flight. If I have somebody who's holding himself up and needs counseling, I'm going to call up a hush negotiation team because that's the best resource I have available to me at that time. And failure to do that, and something going bad, puts this village at financial risk of being sued. To me, SWAT is no different. That if we get a situation that hits SWAT's parameters, and we fail to call them, and because we fail to call them, someone gets hurt, whether that be a citizen or an officer, We've just opened this village up to a huge liability because we failed to use the best resource we had available at that time. Um, I do know any team like that, and, and if you read, if you read the paper a couple weeks ago, uh, I think Sheriff Fisher said they were not used at all, or maybe it's Kirk Keller, at all in 2014. This is not an experienced team. I shouldn't say it's not an experienced team. This is not a team that gets a ton of experience, okay? Um, I came from the Sheriff's Office. We had a SWAT team, multi-agency SWAT team. It got used a lot more than that, but it didn't get used as much as Dayton's. Dayton's SWAT team doesn't get used as much as uh, Columbus. Columbus doesn't get used as much as LA. And so the more use you get, the more practice you get, the better and more proficient you're going to be. Um, it is just the nature of the beast by being in a more rural county. This, this is what we've got. But there will come a situation where they are the appropriate tool and they will be called because that is, again, the best accepted practices throughout the state of Ohio. Separate from the task force question, so we're just going to have to pay attention to the tech of that. I see 
Hi, hello, Jacobs. Uh, first, uh, let me say if I heard you correctly, the next time it snows, uh, I should be calling the department. Is that right? I, I know <laughs> it's not. It's not all those policies I've made, but I know the officers do that for now. So uh, we'll see. I don't want to miss that. Uh, and let me say that uh, I've, I've, I like what I've heard so far tonight, and I've certainly had some really good recent encounters with uh, officers here in town. Uh, Brian, Car Brian Carlson's always been very friendly and very helpful. And the other day I was uh, walking my dog, and an officer pulled up, rolled down his window, and said, Really cute dog you have. I mean, there's no better way to make confidence in a dog. So, uh, and I thought that was really smart. You know, we haven't changed the car. So uh, I like what I see. Um, I want to talk a little bit, though, about the whole you know, SWAT thing. Uh, because the experience that we had uh, when they were used here was, I think, so bad. And it wasn't just that it wasn't good. Their interaction that night was negative. They created chaos. And, and there were too many people, and clearly, the uh, lines of communication and command were all screwed up and it caused big problems to the detriment of, of everybody involved. And I see you nodding your head, so I don't think no, I'm, 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 Yes, from, from what I've read, I, I'm in complete agreement. You know, I hate the armchair quarterback too much, not being there, but yes, there, those were the mistakes, some of the mistakes that I observed or from reading the report. Yeah, and so as a matter of resources, I certainly hope that we would not be putting an officer on the SWAT squad again. But my concern is a little deeper. If they were to be called again, how do we make sure that we don't have the same kind of horrible uh, problems that we had last time? Boy, that's a good question. Um, one of the things that, as you mentioned, uh, my officers, I, I'd like to give a little bit of kudos first to our dispatch team because one of them is here tonight. Uh, they put in a lot of hours, sit there waiting by the phones, doing a lot of very good things. So um, thank you for us. You know, I don't know that I can guarantee it. I, I really don't. Um, you know, there's, but here's the question I you know, I'm posed to. If we're in a situation where the officers go somewhere and someone begins firing out on a home at anybody, okay, you were shooting the air, you're shooting the air, no big deal. But once you're putting that risk of serious physical harm, which is what the law requires, on other citizens or police officers, and I got and one officer on, two officers on, the only other option they have is to drop a 99. Now, 99 will happen. That's going to happen anyway. And that means that officers from all over this county, Clark County, Montgomery County, will respond. But you want to talk about not having leadership. Because there's one Yellow Springs also on. Maybe two. Maybe not a supervisor. Who's in charge of that scene? Who's coordinating them? Uh, again, it may not be the best answer in the world, and, and I'm not going to tell you that, you know, I'm not saying they've not improved. I will tell you that they debriefed after this. It is standard practice. I guarantee you, no different than, than coaching a football team. When you find you got a hole in your defense, you try to coach that hole out. Um, but having a bunch of officers there that are not SWAT is a bigger recipe for disaster. And at some point, again, I have to weigh risk and harm and make that call. And the, the um, you know, I guess the, the one thing I could do, and I step on some political toes, and I'm not saying I will do it, but there are other SWAT teams. Uh, could I call Montgomery County SWAT and get some sort of arrangement for them to respond to Yellow Springs? That would be something, again, that I would not initiate on my own. Um, I would at least make sure I have either the blessing of council or the village manager. There are other options. Um, you know, again, SWAT was called zero times in 2014. So, um, statistically, 
I'd like to think that I can stay here till I'm 60, 62 and not call them all. That would make me very, very happy. But I can't guarantee um, that necessarily it's going to be any better. One of the things that has happened is the state has pushed out to Mark's radios, so which is a, a completely different radio system. It is going pretty much statewide. So the interoperability of the radios, I can get on my radio and talk to the Montgomery County Sheriff's Dispatch Center. I can talk to Warren County Dispatch Center. If they do respond over here, we can get on one channel. One of the problems that happened at the time is you had a fair war team, a fair Marine Rights Van Day team, you had a Dade team, you had Green County team, and they were on three different radio systems. That part has not improved. Um, but, I mean, that's the, that's the only guarantee I can give you, is that the interoperability of the radio system is better. There are a few people that have their hands up, so we have, sure. I would be interested, Helen and I, I would be interested in when a SWAT team has been used specifically, if you know of one or two incidents, under the circumstances when it was called and what the outcome was, because we've had such a bad experience. I'd like to know what a good experience is. I think I, like many people, have a lot of problem about this heavy armored uh, equipment that has been given to uh, people up through the police department. It feels like uh, an outside army coming to us. I, I understand that perception. Um, you, you, what happens is SWAT teams are called when, again, someone is facing serious physical harm, okay? Somebody stepping on my toe is not serious physical harm. You have the, that harm creates a situation where you're gonna be disabled, disfigured, uh, or dead. Okay, so those, those are the circumstances. So if I call and tell you that I pull up in my house and I'm gonna shoot the first cop that shows up, we're probably going to attempt to verify that there's actually someone under that call came from that individual and, and whether or not their threat truly exists. Because people can call and say they're at uh, 225 West South College and not actually be there. Okay? So that would be the first thing. Once that is done, the SWAT team's job is actually to set up a perimeter, contain all of this, and to call it a hostage negotiation. Host SWAT is not designed to work by itself. They are a hand-in-hand -hand joint venture with the hostage negotiation team. SWAT's the head of guns, and then you bring in the negotiators, okay? You contain the problem, then you try to deal with the problem. Um, that, is, that is the logic. At some point, if the negotiations are not going well, at some point, then you decide, someone makes that decision, you've got to use force. If you're at this situation and somebody has been threatening to use a gun, and you've got the hostage negotiator talking and talking and talking, they'll continue to talk. I've seen them go 15, 16 hours. But once somebody starts shooting bullets out of that house that can land in other people's homes or court officers, hostage negotiation is done. It becomes a SWAT team thing. And the heavy armored stuff is because I've had a bullet or two that was past me, and I want that heavy armor. Uh, it should not be. There is no need for it to be here in the old springs. But the SWAT teams are going to get that heavy armor stuff. And I can show you pictures of those SWAT vehicles and where the bullets hit and knock the paint off of them and the bullet holes in the cruisers. Uh, TV does a lot of really, really great things. But I can tell you, if I shoot a gun through a door of a police cruiser, it goes completely through that door. There's a little bit of sheet metal, a little bit of glass, a little bit of upholstery, and then it's in a human being. They're not covered, okay? They are at best concealment. Bullets penetrate things. You can shoot through drywall, and it'll go through two, three sheets of drywall real easy. It'll go through a two-by-four. So 
they, when you start getting into someone shooting at you, it is a military thing. And that's why the military equipment is used. Now, do I want everyday officers using that? No. No, that is not what it's there for. But you will not find a SWAT team that is not, to some degree, very paramilitary because they're designed that if and when somebody starts shooting, the officer's safety. That's what it's there for. Um, and it is, it is the way things are going. I understand people may not be happy with that, and I can't control the SWAT team. I would say that would be continued use. Um, again, the idea is to get a hostage negotiation team to get in there to negotiate. That is the objective. But that individual come out without harming the soul. All right. So uh, I know I have three people in the queue, but I'm being told that we also need to make sure we cover that. Jim Crow, um, and she reports the use of SWAT teams 
In 72, there were just about 100 SWAT, SWAT teams deployed in the whole United States. In uh, the early 80s, 3,000. Um, in 2001, 40,000. Now there are hundreds of thousands of these. They're nearly always in, you know, employed uh, against people of color in the, in the inner cities. And uh, I mean, it's hor there are horrible stories about it. Uh, the issue of race hasn't come up yet tonight, and I think it's a crucial thing. I, in the past, I, we've had police who lived in town and were sensitive to the race issue. It, it gives me concern for, for what happened in Bellbrook and what's happened with the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office, the racist uh, uh, things. And I, I was born and raised in Ferguson, Missouri, and uh, so I, I know about all this stuff going on there. So uh, I don't know if you want to comment on any of that, but... Um, I don't think you need to be in the old supremacy sense of the race. Um, I mean, the race thing, and, and I'm happy to talk about it. As a matter of fact, I'm meeting the group Saturday will be specifically on the race. Uh, you better set two or three hours out. Um, you know, um, there has been a proliferation. I cannot, I, I can't argue that. In 1987, 88, I carried a split six shooter. Um, and by the 94, 95, we went to semi autos. In about 2000, uh, cruisers all started getting patrol rifles. I mean, would I love to roll back the clock? Sure. If you can figure out how to roll it, you let me know. But this is not the same society we lived in in, in the 60s. And um, you're in a very litigious society where everybody wants to sue somebody, and police departments, to some degree, have formed SWAT teams because they didn't use one, failed to use one, someone got hurt, or they have, you can't have a hostage negotiation team unless you've got someone there to protect them. They are in hand in hand. And the hostage negotiation teams, much like the CIT training, it is moving in. And CIT training, you will see, will become a mandatory thing in law enforcement. So there's a lot of good that has went. Um, but, but again, when you start looking at what we've dealt with, post 9 11, post other things, um, you know, you start, you know, no one ever thought about police officers having to go and shoot an active shooter in, in a school, having to confront an active shooter. But, we're, you know, we're governed, we're held to that standard, and we have to have plans. So, I would, again, maybe some of this is because of the military surplus, and I, mean, I really can't argue that point one way or the other. I, I definitely think you have a point, I understand the point, but again, we didn't worry about active shooters in school when I was in patrol, never even heard of, never, never really crossed our mind. You know, every now and then you have a, a dad want to come in and take a non-custodial child or something. And that was the extent of it. But it, the world's changed. And, and police departments have to answer that change. As they are part of government, they're expected to. And again, we start looking at the liability. I think it will continue, unfortunately. So, uh, that's not that easy. Okay, um, the, the ACE Drug Task Force uh, I know everyone, and I can call it the Drug Task Force. Um, it, it is truly a task force, and by their charter, um, it is set up to confront any problem that becomes a, a, a problem for its, its agencies. Um, as a matter of fact, when I set the range up, I stole Warren County Drug Task Force um, policies and procedures and their bylaws and ACEs and the old cane, and then I, I chopped them all together, took the best parts of them. Um, and the idea is that they do more than just the drug things. There are certain things that just become problematic. Uh, in 2006, 2005, I became out, 2003, I came out of, out of uh, dispatch, did a year on the street. They put me back into the drug unit as a supervisor. And we got approached with a case that we turned the van to and we worked at ACE task force. It was three individuals. 
who, what they would do was number one, they'd go out, um, get barely stoned up, um, have some girl drive out somewhere they were unfamiliar with. The girl would then kill her lights, make a U-turn, come back, drop them off, and their way of living and fun for them was for each of them to go in three different directions, steal as much as they could, including a vehicle, and see if they could bring home a stuff at the end. This is what these guys did three and four nights a week. I mean, this was their, their way of living. And we worked it jointly with them. Um, we solved, and I apologize, I, I probably could look at it, either 180 burglaries in Montgomery County alone, or 180 burglaries in Green, Montgomery, Miami, Dark, Warren. There may be another, I think probably count. Um, because this is what these guys would do. They were centered in Drexel, and they would, they'd go out, and they wanted to be somewhere they didn't know. It didn't happen four blocks over. They would go over and stuff stuff from their neighbors. They went out into the farming community and go, oh, that's cool. Let's go back to this place. We had a car GPS. We could watch them out for a while. And we'd see them every night making these new terms. We didn't know exactly what it was. One night we'd be behind them up in Dark County. Uh, they actually stopped across the street from the man who is now the chief deputy in Dark County, who blew our investigation off because he sees all these cars on the country road in the middle of the night, comes out with his gun and his plain clothes, and we're lucky things didn't die for us. Uh, but we ended up getting them later on. So they do things besides just the drug task force. Um, they do drugs, but what they will do is anything that is um, larger than some police departments can do. You know, Montgomery County, we did escort services. Because an escort service doesn't just be a problem for Harrison Township. It's not a Washington Township problem. It's not a Dayton problem. These places operate in a large area. And no one police department wants to foot the bill for that investigation. So you join together your resources and attack some of these problems. Drugs are a big problem. And although there are clearly some residents in Yellow Springs who wish they weren't. They are illegal. Um, my job is to uphold the law, and the law now says they're illegal. If the law changes next year and marijuana becomes legalized, God willing and counsel willing, I'll still be the chief of police here. I will still come in and do my job. It doesn't change anything. that much. It's just, you know, my job is not to figure out and debate legalities of things. My job and my oath is to uphold the law. And right now they're illegal. I also believe when you look at it, and I'm not talking personal use stuff, I'm not talking the, the guy who, who's got, uh, and it's, it's not a five cent bag, I refer to a nickel bag. Uh, I think the paper sort of lost the translation a little bit. But, uh, small amounts of weed, again, you can debate that all day long, but there is violence associated with drugs. Um, when I go back to relating my experience, please understand, because I Sometimes I say things, and I'm speaking from the Montgomery County Sheriff's Deputy perspective, and they're sometimes being perceived that that's a problem in Yellow Springs. I do not necessarily mean to infer it, but I think if you go back and you look at the E.D. Bicari case, and you look like John Brody started the participation in the drug task force, you can see there is drugs and there is violence. Um, Additionally, with the drugs and violence, you get the peripheral clients. You get the people who is, you know, stealing the aluminum, taking you know, the air conditioner sets. These guys aren't taking air conditioners and putting them in on their own. They're not stealing them from churches so they can operate their warehouse. They're taking these air conditioners, they're throwing them in the back of pickups, they're stealing the copper from them, trading it here, scrapping the rest of it, and it costs them large money. And that is not done so that they can buy extra tuna fish and eat. I would say 90 plus percent of this is to fund drug habits. And when you start looking at people and looking at the crimes they do, a lot of it, of the peripheral crimes, is to support their drug habit or is directly related to the lower inhibitions that you get 
with <coughs> being stoned. Um, again, my band of thieves got them. They admitted, we, you know, we get out and, and get stoned. Think about how much hustle it would take to break into somebody's home. Go into a neighbor's home that you don't know. Wrap your brain around doing it. Most of us can't do that. But this is what these criminals do. Uh, if you go back and you look at the gun slams and, and you look at how you know, TV is portrayed as one thing, most of them went and had those couple shots of whiskey. Why? To settle their nerves, to, to, to lower their inhibitions before they go out and, and have a gun pointed at them and maybe die. You know, a lot of people doing these violent crimes, it's the same thing. They can't do it dead up sober, okay? I've got a whole dissertation out here, um, a guy named Daryl Wayne Ferguson, and I mentioned him during the hire process. When I was a sergeant in jail, Daryl Wayne was in jail. Uh, sober, Daryl Wayne sent two letters to the judge asking for the death penalty because he killed three people by stabbing, beating, and kicking them to death. Uh, one of which was a double amputee in a wheelchair that he knew, and another couple that he knew. Because he got a couple day pass in rehab, got out, got using, was on a roll, and this is the violence that ensued. So I know there's a lot of people who can smoke their joint, hit, hit the bong, and walk around and do metal and all that sort of cool. And again, you, we can debate that all day. I'm not even sure what side I fall on. But that's really not what the drug task force, when it's used, it is there for. Okay? It is to go to the upper level stuff and to get after uh, the violence associated with it. When I left the drug unit late 2000, crackheads, 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 that's what we dealt with. When I came back out and became in charge of it back in 2005, um, you go out to buy crack, you sit in the form and then you buy crack, and the dope dealers would hand you a hair. They hand you half it to a hair. And the informants would dude, I don't want to use this, man. What's this all about? I'm sorry, we had to save some time for questions like that. I hope you did. It's a good story. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you 38 seconds I'll finish it off? For, for Dominic, what it was, this is post 9 11. And there is a desire from the opium producing nations to get in on it. And it's more addictive, it's more profit in it, it's not grown in Mexico. So tell me where do you think this money is eventually going back to? Um, there, it's, it's what happens. So there is that tie to terrorism and groups that do horrific things that anyone in Yellow Springs that I've ever met would be very, very offended. 30 seconds, I'm on it, right? Correct. Awesome. All right, so Christy, can you hear me? Hi, I'm Christy Cruz. Um, so my question about the task force, and I saw your report that you wrote before you were hired as our chief, um, breaking it down as to why financially it looks like it's not a bad proposition. Um, however, I spoke with Mr. May myself, and uh, first of all, he told me specifically that uh, SWAT team is used sometimes with the drug task force, and this was after our village council had said that we would no longer participate in the SWAT team, which means we should probably not have the task force if they use the SWAT team, that's the same thing. And then back to the financial aspect, um, considering that our village is in a budget crisis, it seems like to spend uh, the money to pay a full-time officer, his, his salary, <coughs> plus all the benefits that he receives, would really be more, and this officer doesn't work here in our community, would really be more of a luxury than something that we should be automatically subscribed to. And also a lot of people in the community, I'm not saying everyone, because some people are for the drug task force participation. We have a lot of other reasons why we that aren't just the financial considerations or taking down big drug dealers, but other considerations. For instance, I saw a video of the task force arrest doing a big drug sweep in Kenya, and most of the people that they were arresting, they were big drug dealers. They were living in little shacks with gravel yards and clearly were not making a big fortune from their, their exploits. 
So that's other objections, which I think kind of blends in with community values. So how can you assure me that when we consider this again, whether we participate in drug taxes, that all of these things are going to be factored in, not just the financial aspect, the training aspect, but also our community values? Okay, you, you, you have a lot of points, and I'm not sure I can, I will read and recall them. It's a very long question with several points, so forgive me if I don't get to them all. Um, participating in SWAT does not mean we will not use SWAT. I don't, if council has a different view on that, then that's something I'll have to discuss with me. Um, but, and SWAT will, again, normally, I guess I probably should have prefaced that, normally will work in a standoff situation with a hostage negotiation team. And if I am a drug unit and in a home and I have intelligence that there's armed individuals in that home, then SWAT will do the end. And again, that's just Mr. May's deal, but that's how it worked in, in Montgomery County. Um, so uh, again, as, as, there was a lot of questions. The financial end of things, my street officers bring in zero money. If they decided tomorrow that we can no longer get forfeited assets from drug dealers, I'd still be a supporter of the drug unit. Again, when you look at what it does, how it affects people, and, and I, it, I know it is not a causal effect, because I have people who are far more educated than me here, you know, I, you can't show there's a causal effect between drugs and mental illness, but they're clearly, clearly, there's this correlation that tends to go hand in hand. And with that, you end up with, again, increased violence, increased crime. Um, you say they're not here, but we have a case where they took off several hundred thousand dollars worth of what is known as DNT, which is the new LSD that was being sold here in the streets of Yellow Springs. The guy Friday night was coming here with the weed and the gun and the money to sell dope here in Yellow Springs. It does happen. Just because you're not seeing it, you don't get to see the seedy side of things, does not mean it does not exist. As far as who they arrest, well, they'll do an investigation. They may encompass 15 or 20 people. It does not mean they're all kingpins in this. It does not mean that any one of them is necessarily a kingpin, okay? It's a little bit like fishing. They're gonna throw out the line and every now and then they're gonna catch a pound and a half bass and every now and then they're gonna catch a six pound bass. There aren't nearly as many six pound bass as there are pound and a half basses, but you've got to get out there and cast the line. And I believe that is what we should do. Um, I think I've let council know my opinion on, I like being part of it. I think it is, it is good for the community. Uh, again, council controls the budget. I've also said that if we got a situation where council told me I needed to cut a person, I would cut that person before I would lower patrol. But under the current budget, and we're coming in, our budget was cut. We did some things. Uh, we're continuing to do it. Again, I'm still in favor. And I think some of the things you're not looking at is the training experience these people get. Um, if, if you become the victim of a violent crime and we have a homicide scene, there has to be a search warrant written for us to go in there because we don't know who the suspect is yet and we have to get a search warrant so that that evidence collected can be used against that person. If that person lives in the same house and we go in illegally, it's all dismissed and your homicide never gets solved and you never get punished. Well, one of the things you learn in, in the task force is I like search warrants. After the stop fighting night, that detective came into Yellow Springs, did the interviews of these guys. Uh, he did not confess that the other two in the car did. We will likely prosecute that charge through the ATF, through the federal system. Um, so you get lots of benefits and talents. And eventually that individual will come back to Yellow Springs and he will be a mentor to these other guys. Because again, I believe I have good officers, but I don't have vastly experienced officers. And this is a way to get a lot of experience, to bring it back, to let people, you know, try it. You, you look at Dennis Nipper, who's been around for everybody 44 years, and everybody loves Dennis. Why do we love Dennis? Because Dennis has knowledge. And again, the kids like going to the big brother and getting some of that knowledge imparted to them. And the task force makes that individual out there, if he's a conscientious, conscientious employee, a 
big brother and an asset when he comes back to the department. Um, so I get away from the money thing. Uh, the money we have to pay to join outside of personnel costs comes out of seized assets. So it's sort of a non factor. I, I don't know if I answered them all, Chris, because again, you had a lot of points. I missed something, speak up, and I'll try to address it. I'm John Hunter. Um So, if the purpose of a, sorry, um, my own opposition to uh, the drug task force stems from the fact, um, stems from the fact that uh, there is a broad consensus that drug enforcement has no effect on drug drug use. Whether you're talking to like economists or um, the UN Global Commission on Drugs. Um, or just like uh, looking at the, the history of, of drug use in this country. Um, I mean, one of the most obvious examples would be looking at drug use in prison. I mean, it suggests that in a world in which everyone is a police officer, only police officers would sell drugs. Like, it, it, it appears, it's, so it's not that I'm like blaming law enforcement for being incapable to defeat this problem. It appears to be a problem that law enforcement is basically incapable of addressing, that, that its tools are not capable of um, lowering drug use. I mean, if you're going out there catching one in six, six ton bat basses, but there's always going to be more fish, then what's the point? Like, also when you consider all the great um, costs of incarceration, and also when you consider the great prevalence of drug use, it just seems like a recipe for making, um, for putting a lot of people in prison and making the police, um, making a huge swath of the community feel that the police is the enemy. Okay. I mean, I, you know, can I wrap my brain around if we legalize everything, and did away with incarceration for these things, and said, uh, you know, let's let's let Walmart start selling dope, and so these poor Colombian kids aren't being used to process cocaine, and um, you know the, the money being spread, and we take them, we tax it, and we get treatment for people who want the treatment instead of the courts mandating treatment for people who want to stay out of prison. Can I wrap my brain around that argument? Sure. I may it be right. Yeah, I don't know. I gotta fall back into I'm a police officer. These are laws. The once the federal government, the states adopt this, I'll go okay. But that's not where we're at. And my job is to enforce the law. And I will continue to do it to the best of my ability. Because when I was interviewed for this job, that's what I told them I would do. I take it up. And the oath, oath is to uphold the laws of the state of Ohio and the United States of America to the best of my ability. And oaths mean things to me. And again, you know, I, I'm not saying I'm a proponent of legalization of everything. I, I consciously can can make that argument. Uh, do we do we maybe get rid of some of the thug community, get some of the violence off the street? Yes, yeah, good possibility. Um, brighter minds than, than me have to tackle that question. But until it becomes legalized, my job is to pursue it. The, the consensus in America is you're not going to wipe it out. You're on the drugs, and I know I never liked it. I uh, never liked the term. But it's much like prostitution to some degree. It's been around since the Bible. We've never wiped it out. We're never going to wipe out demand. I work North Dixie. We used to have girls walk up and down the street flagging down cars. The neighbors complained. What was the solution? Well, the prostitutes are still there, but we put enough pressure on them that they conduct their business practices in a little more civil manner and don't upset the citizens who live two blocks off, two houses off of North Dixie. So maybe that's all we're doing is hitting that compromise, hitting enough pressure that things will stay underground. I mean, Again, I, I don't know, and intellectually, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not going to argue with your point, but i got to fall back on, as long as it's illegal, I have to do what I do.
Chairman Ames Bomani. Uh, so one of the things that troubles me is your claim that you know these are laws and all this, these are laws and your oath is to uphold the law, but <clears throat> that doesn't necessarily mean that the laws are good. Uh, once upon a time, it was illegal to uh, to lynch black people. Once upon a time in this country, it was uh, <clears throat> after it was really illegal after slavery when uh, farmers and people in the industry began to understand they lost the benefit of free labor. It became legal to uh, arrest black men who weren't working. They created laws called vagrancy, put them in jail, hired them back out. So those were laws. And so if you're just going to like uphold, blindly uphold the law, and that is like your stance, then uh, that really troubles me. <clears throat> so just because we have laws does not mean the way we're going now, and with the situation that happened over in Beaver Creek, uh, we have an attorney general who basically, if he had his way, it would be illegal. It would be legal to shoot a black man on the spot in 0.36 seconds, I should say, in 36 one hundredths of a second, <clears throat> and just write it off as an unfortunate tragedy. So if that's all you got to stand on is like an oath of upholding the law because it's a law, you know, <clears throat> we now have unwritten laws all across this country that it's, it, that it's legal to kill black people on the spot, on, uh, armed, unarmed, mentally ill, naked. So if that's, if that's what you're standing on, then you are, uh, I really got problems with you. If you don't think they're not going to prioritize a little bit 
and deal with those other two first and maybe not get to the third, I think you're wrong. So I think it would affect us for not having them. I'm one of Bruce May's bosses. We would quit being his boss, and there is politics at work everywhere. And being part of his boss has a little pull and a little clout, and um, I'm not so sure that they would say they never come back if we had a big problem, but I think their, their efforts would be less concentrated here, or to a, concentrated here to a lesser degree. It's probably more appropriate. We are right at, at about nine. Um, and I'm wondering if there's anyone else that has a question before we wrap up. Um, I'm Lori Greenspan. Um, is this doing the same? Yes. Anyway. Um, one of the concerns that I have that hasn't been addressed yet tonight um, is one of the things I value about living here is there are lots and lots of us who care about where we live and do a lot of things that positively affect the um, life in general, but also individual situations um, as they come up. And one of the things I would like to see um, as you get more used to the town and the town gets more used to you and your other officers is getting more organized about how different ones of us who are also protecting and serving all the time in our ways are in contact with and have each other's ear in a more organized um, way. I'm particularly concerned about um, our youth. Um, it's really important that there be gradually rapport built up um, with the young people and the police officers and other resources in the community. And if you don't know what the different resources are, and if I don't know the ways in which I can call on you or make myself known to you best, then the whole town loses out more. And we can, together, find ways to collaborate better about this kind of thing. So it's not a question, it's just... I, no, I'm in complete agreement. Um, you know, I know one of the things Officer Meister is very good at being there at the crosswalk. Um, I know Officer Sexton is also on days is out there quite often. Um, I'm a supporter of that for some, to some degree. Um, you know, we got a complaint a couple of days ago of somebody driving really fast on Walmart. Well, if our guys are always at the crosswalk or always opening doors, we're not addressing the speeders. So, for doubling what the policy says, is most days of the week you should be in the area of the school from these times. Now, um, you know, whether or not they're physically opening doors or they're running radar, um, you know, you, again, you've got to be flexible and be intelligent as to what the needs are. If we're there opening doors every day, that means there's absolutely no one sitting at the bank here on the, on the north end of town. And if I was going to rob a bank, I'd go, hmm. Okay, so I don't like the idea of saying five days a week you will be here at 8.15 to 8.30 opening doors. But they are out there, they are visible. Um, the village manager wants some sort of form of mentoring program through the PD. Um, I'm trying to right now sort of grasp what is actually out here and in the community. And I've been working with John Gudgel as much as possible. Um, Clearly, the police department has a role in that. My view at this point is we, we want to be active, but I also, because I am new and I'm not that familiar, the last thing I want to do is start a competing program when you have something already well that's working. I would much rather supplement that to give him man hours and bodies and if there's funding or something that we can contribute to do those things. Um, 
Again, it's something I know council has the desire for us to do that. The village manager has expressed that. And to some degree, again, yeah, I'm trying to get my feel as to what's out there, what's the best way to do it, how to be most effective. And again, I, I have no problem with it, but I also don't want to start another new thing and then, and then take away from a good thing. So um, um, I'd like, I believe we will be there. Um, again, getting out to the community, letting people know, you know, you can talk to me, you can call me. If you've got a question, hey, can you guys do this? Or is this within the police department's purview? Can you, can you fund this? Is there money here for this? We want to apply for a grant, all those things. Call me. Um, you know, uh, again, I, I try to get out, I try to go through town. I try to, uh, to make myself accessible. Um, so let, let your neighbors know. I, if they got something, send it to me. My job is to take those phone calls and uh, answer the questions the, the best that I can. But, uh, I'm willing to do it. Any other questions? Yeah, that's all. Oh, I just wanted to add something really quick. That, uh, the chief knows about, and actually, uh, Cabin Davies back there is going to be working with department and dispatch on our yellowspringshealth.org project that the Human Relations Commission started. And that is going to be a great way to, I think, address exactly what Lori is talking about. What are all those resources and tie them together? So I didn't want to mention that because that's going to happen starting on mid-April for three months. Yes. And um, I just want to mention that I don't know if we can go over the meeting that if you can get your questions in tonight, do you recall this community, continuing community conversation? We will be playing more policing forum issues. So, okay. <coughs> and also the comment cards, put them on the comment cards. <coughs> So we appreciate everyone for coming and thanks for your time this evening. And, uh, if you have more questions and want to